I would like to invite our chairman, Mr. Davinder Singh SC, to deliver his welcome address. Davinder, please. Minister for Culture, Community and Youth, and Second Minister for Law, Mr. Edwin Tong, Honorable Judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Sanjay Kishan Call, members of the judiciary, Vice President of the SIAC Court of Arbitration, Mr. Toby Landau, fellow SIAC board members, and in particular Rajiv, members of the SIAC Court of Arbitration, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be back. The last time I was here, before COVID, set in me a yearning to return to Delhi, and I wonder why. My dad left what was then um, India, but now Pakistan. Um, he was from Quetta many, many decades ago. Um, found himself in Singapore, where he married and started a family. And he remained in Singapore for the rest of his life, but he always had a yearning for the soil of India. And he would say so, something that I would never understand. But as I returned to India from time to time, and as I grew older, these things begin to take on a different color and significance. And you, you realize that you may be born in Singapore, you may grow up a Singaporean, you may love Singapore, but where your parents come from never ever leaves you. And that was brought home to me in a dramatic and very interesting fashion. When my two boys, born in Singapore, don't speak Punjabi, don't understand Punjabi, um, were watching a cricket game. They were six and seven at that time. India was playing Australia, I think it was. And I was late from work. Um, and I came home, and they ran out of the house to greet me. And I said, what's the score? What's the score? And they said, we won. They had never been to India. They had never seen anything remotely resembling what this beautiful country represents. But when it's in your blood, it never leaves you. And so for those of you who live here, the one thing that you don't fully appreciate is that for someone like me and others um, in my situation, we watch developments in the country of our parents or our father very closely. And I must say with great admiration that it is remarkable that India has come so far. The world has a lot to say about the democracy in this country. The world has a lot to say about the noise in this country. But today, when you read the newspapers and when you follow social media, there are certain things which are now becoming certainties. The first is that, as the Financial Times reported um, earlier this month, in this decade, India is going to drive 20% of the growth in the world, in a world which is starved of growth. In this decade, India, which has now stood up and people have taken notice of India, is going to reap the dividends of its demographic profile. From Singapore and from SIAC's perspective, I can see that firsthand. There is immense interest among many young Indian lawyers, talented, ambitious, brilliant, wanting to develop their expertise and their exposure and their experience in international arbitration. And they have so much to offer. 
unfortunately, the opportunities cannot keep up with that appetite. And in the world that we face today with Ukraine and the other difficulties that we are facing, we note how India has stood its ground and has remained unshakable in its commitment to what is in its own interest. And because India has now transformed itself into a country that everyone doffs his hat to, that everyone respects, we are now at a time where the world has much to learn from you, and which is one of the reasons we in SIAC are here today. We are here to say thank you for the support that you've given us. I have to tell you that without India's support, SIAC would not be where we are today. In the last 10 years, we've had over 1,300 cases involving more than 2,000 Indian parties. And because India is so critical to SIAC's growth in the next phase, I wanted very much for our minister, Minister Edwin Tong, to come to see for himself the wonderful opportunities that exist in this country, the great talent and the boundless energy which one feels when one lands in New Delhi. And I'd like to thank the minister who is extremely busy with many, many uh, matters on his plate uh, for taking time off to come to India, to come to Delhi for this occasion. Thank you, Minister. I'd also like to thank the Indian judiciary at every level up to the Supreme Court for its increasingly sophisticated judgments and guidance on international arbitration law. Your judgments are second to none in terms of their ability to assimilate the latest issues and to keep international arbitration at the forefront of dispute resolution. And it matters a great deal to us that uh, Justice Call, you've taken time to come here uh, together with retired Supreme Court judges it means a lot to us that uh, despite the fact that today is a very, very important day for you and there are many other events that you have given us um, a bit of your time. So we are here today, as I said, to thank you. We're here today to recognize the fact that without you, we wouldn't be where we are. But we're also here today because there are a number of interesting issues that have arisen in international arbitration, and you'll hear more about that um, in the sessions that will follow. And one of the things that um, has cropped up time and again is the complexity and costs of international arbitration. You know that almost every conference dealing with international arbitration talks about that. How do we deal with this increasing complexity and increasing cost of arbitration? And to be honest, the answers are elusive. It is difficult because of the nature of the beast. There are disputes and there are disputes. And when you have complex disputes going into arbitration, it's very difficult to bring them down to the basic simple level, it's very difficult to contain costs. And so we thought at SIAC that since we are grappling with this issue and we haven't yet, to be entirely candid with you, come to a, a satisfactory answer, that we should put this on the table in this event because we want to hear what India has to say about it. India, which is growing in, by leaps and bounds in international arbitration, has a great stake in, in these issues, and we would very much like to hear your views. 
we look forward to a very exciting day of interesting discussions. And for that, I'd like to thank a few people for making the time to come here. I'd like to thank, first of all, Rajiv. Rajiv, without you, this conference would not be possible. There have been many challenges, and you have helped us overcome all of them. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Lucy Reed, who is our president of the court, uh, who unfortunately can't be with us, but who has given us complete and full support. I'd like to thank my dear friend, Toby Landau. Toby is a vice president of the SIAC court, and he has been a tremendous, tremendous supporter and foundation of SIAC. Um, he's never said no to any request to him to come help out. You know he's an extremely busy barrister and uh, practitioner, but he finds the time, and thank you very much, Toby. Uh, I'd also like to thank fellow Indian court members, Harish Salve, Tejas, and Shanin, but especially Darius. Uh, Darius, who <laughs> is so busy and has so many things uh, on his desk, agreed uh, at our request to come here, despite his schedule, um, to interview and to ask questions of our minister. Thank you so much, Darius, for all of that. I'd also like to thank the wonderful SIAC team. We have a first-rate team led by our CEO, Gloria, and our registrar, Kevin, whom all of you know. We have an excellent representation in India with Shweta and her team. Thank you so much. Shweta hasn't slept for a few days. Thank you, Shweta, for not sleeping. Um, and if I have not mentioned any one of you, forgive me, but it's so nice that all of you here have come to contribute. And for me personally, it is special that my dear friend from law school, who has reached the heights um, and is set on the Court of Appeal and become Singapore's Attorney General, Justice VK Raja is here. And it means a lot, VK, that you've come to share your thoughts. On that note, I wish you all a very interesting and constructive afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Singh. We are greatly honored to have Justice Sanjay Kishan Call joining us today for the keynote address. Justice Call, may I invite you on stage? Mr. Edwin Tong, the Minister of Culture, uh, judges, my former colleagues on the bench, the SIAC board, who have invited me here and the Rais Kambata, Mr. Vicky Raja, and uh, the concerned person who is organizing it here and has compelled me to come here, <laughs> Mr. Rajiv Lutra. He used his uh, persuasive skills and, and his force to get me here. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, happy Law Day to you. That's a very important day for us today, and that's what the functions are going on in the Supreme Court for. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to deliver this keynote address for today's conference, organized by SIACA on our National Constitution Day. We celebrate our Indian Constitution as a living document and its adaptability with changing times. Today's conference deals with yet another dynamic sphere in the Indian legal field, that is the contemporary challenges and opportunities in international arbitration. I would like to begin by uh, dispelling a misconception that arbitration is a new concept in India. As before the current arbitration framework, the law governing arbitration in India consisted of three statutes, the Arbitration Protocol and Convention of 1937, the Indian Arbitration Act of 1940, and the Foreign Award Recognition and Enforcement Act of 1961. Despite this long history, the arbitration regime in India did not progress as expected. Over time, as India emerged as a global power, we needed to promote an efficient system 
which nurtured domestic businesses and created an ecosystem that had a potential to make our country a fertile ground for international investment. In this regard, India began making strides in attempting to create a more business-friendly environment. The demands of such an environment were twofold, an expeditious mode for settling disputes and the availability of dispute resolution with business models cutting across borders. As a result, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act was passed in 1996, modeled on lines of the Unset Trial Model Framework of Laws. This showed an effort to modernize the Indian arbitration law and align it with the best global practices in an attempt to establish India as a global arbitration hub. The objective of the 1996 Act is to provide a speedy and cost-effective dispute resolution mechanism that gives parties finality in their disputes. The 1996 Act subsequently witnessed landmark amendments in 2015, 2019, and 2021. These amendments were introduced broadly to make arbitration within India user-friendly as well as cost and time effective, to ensure speedy disposal of arbitrations, to provide a framework regarding neutrality and qualification of arbitrators, and provide, give impetus to institutional arbitration. The endeavors of the Indian legislature to continuously improve the arbitration landscape in India have been supplemented by the landmark rulings delivered by the Indian courts. Among other important decisions which espouse pro-arbitration values, the courts have narrowed down the scope of public policy objection in the context of domestic and foreign seated arbitrations and clarified the various nuances of arbitrability of disputes. Here I would like to mention the multiple judgments passed in 2021 itself, which make India an effective seat of arbitration. Even though the Arbitration Act 96 does not explicitly address whether two Indian parties can agree to a foreign seat of arbitration, the Supreme Court in PSL Win Solutions held that party autonomy is the foundation on which the Arbitration Act in India is built. And this autonomy includes the right of the parties to choose the foreign seat of arbitration. Further, in NN Global Mercantile Private Limited, the Supreme Court allowed a reference to arbitration, even in cases where documents containing the arbitration agreement were unstamped or insufficiently stamped. In Delhi Airport Metro Express Private Limited, the Supreme Court held that the construction of the contract is within the jurisdiction of arbitral tribunal only, and the courts cannot substitute its view with view of the tribunal. In addition to the efforts of the Indian judiciary and the legislature, arbitrators and parties to arbitration have a big role to play in the efficiency of the arbitral proceedings. As arbitration is different from litigation, the time-consuming methods of long oral arguments, long written submissions, and reference to precedence must be avoided in arbitration. On the side, this is something I seek to encourage even in courts to reduce the level of the oral arguments. India has been developing its arbitration law enthusiastically, but naturally in the process, there are several questions that are yet to be answered. I would like to highlight such emerging issues relating to arbitration in India. Firstly, is the validity of the emergency arbitration awards and orders. The 246th report of the Law Commission of India had recommended an amendment to the Arbitration Act that decisions of emergency arbitrators be given a statutory recognition in India. This was reiterated by the BN Sri Krishna Committee report in 2017, which noted that courts had held that an emergency award in an arbitration seated outside India was not directly enforceable in India. However, this recommendation was not accepted, and as such, the phrase Emergency arbitration was omitted from 2015 amendment to the Act. The recent future Amazon dispute brought forth the question on whether emergency awards are enforceable in India. The Supreme Court took a progressive step by enforcing an emergency award, oblique order, rendered by an emergency tribunal appointed by the Singapore International Arbitration Center. 
The court held that term arbitral tribunal contained in section 17 of the act includes an emergency arbitration within its fold. However, the Supreme Court in a subsequent order stated that emergency award can be vacated by courts. While this debate was ongoing, the future group initiated fresh litigation, even thereby proving that parties have a big role to play in the fruition of decisions relating to enforcement of emergency awards. Without the assistance of the parties and courts, decisions attempting to make India into a pro-arbitration jurisdiction will be rendered merely academic. The second aspect I'm referring to is the application of group companies doctrine in India. A challenge that has perplexed jurists in India and the world is the question of whether an arbitration agreement would extend to non-signatories as well. In the case of Chloro Controls India, the Supreme Court discussed the group of companies doctrine while dealing with the case of international arbitration under part two of the Arbitration Act. It was held that non-signatory or third party could be subjected to arbitration without its prior consent in exceptional circumstances. However, in a recent decision in Cox and Kings, the Supreme Court, after undertaking a detailed review of the evolution of jurisprudential position on the group company's doctrine, opined that the same needed to be relooked. Uncertain standards of prima facie fraud, something which troubles the arbitration. The 2021 Amendment Act has introduced a new proviso to subsection 3 of section 36 of the Act. The proviso allows an unconditional stay on the enforcement of an Indian seated arbitration award, provided there is a prima facie finding by the court that the arbitration agreement or contract, which is the basis of an award or making of the award, was induced or affected by fraud or corruption. Courts hearing enforcement or arbitral awards are yet to determine the standards on which to take this prima facie view on the aspect of fraud and corruption on a mere reading of the documents as a detailed inquiry may be required for the purposes of such adjudication. The next aspect which I'm dealing with is third party funding. Another pertinent topic in the realm of arbitration is third party funding. In essence, the concept can be as simple as third party funding and arbitration efforts of a claimant in the hope of getting a sizable return in case of a successful claim and can also be a complex as portfolio investment, oblique a law firm portfolio financing. Without going into details of all the possible kinds of funding mechanisms and options, it will be safe to say that this area of international arbitration is still at a nascent stage. However, a third party funding poses some questions and issues that remain to be completely settled, including issues pertaining with disclosures, confidentiality, and doctrine of champerty in maintenance. Even though it can be said that a third party funding is broadly accepted in common law jurisdiction, there remains legal uncertainties in India. There are some of the issues that are being debated enthusiastically among the judiciary, legislature and arbitration, scholars in India, and I'm certain that we will have effective solution to these problems soon. A major change in Indian arbitration landscape came in 2019. The 2019 amendment was passed with a view to promote institutional arbitration in India and included several critical changes. It introduced provisions for establishing the Arbitration Council of India that would grade arbitral law institutions, recognize professional institutes that are provided accreditation to the arbitrators, issue recommendations and guidelines for arbitral institutions, and take steps to make India a center for domestic and international arbitration. Further, the Supreme Court and the High Court were given the ability to designate arbitral institutions that have been accredited by the Arbitration Council of India with the power to appoint arbitrators. Today, India is home to several arbitral institutions, such as the Delhi International Arbitration Center, Mumbai Center for International Arbitration, Madras High Court Arbitration Center, Nani Palkiwala Arbitration Center, and the Indian Council of Arbitration. 
this transition from ad hoc to institutional arbitration in India is important. The arbitral institutions provide pre-established rules and procedures which create certainty during the arbitral proceeding, something which the SICA does. The arbitral institutions also give administrative assistance from institutions providing a sectariat or court arbitration. The institutions also have a list of qualified arbitrators with the relevant expertise and further take care of logistics such as physical facilities and support services for arbitration. As the docket of the Indian courts keep overflowing, commercial players in India and abroad have developed a strong preference to resolve the disputes via arbitration. The last few years have shown an increasing trend in adoption of arbitration as a viable alternative to settle disputes in India. Courts and legislators have acted with a view to bringing Indian arbitration law in line with the international best practices. With the pro-arbitration approach of the courts and the 2015, 2019 and 2021 Amendments Act in place, there is reason to look forward to these best practices being adopted in the Indian arbitration law in the near future. In addition to arbitration, another effective method to solve disputes is combining the mediation and arbitration processes, known as MEDAP or WAP med depending on which process was initiated first. This process combines the benefits of both forms of dispute resolution. MEDAP can help in reaching an earlier settlement by bringing the parties closer by indicating the likely outcome of formal proceedings and thereby encouraging the parties to settle the matter. An early settlement can save both money and time. And I have been a great votary of the mediation process or its combination with arbitration because I think they can bring about solutions which the normal formal legal systems find it difficult to get by. Exciting times are ahead for the Indian dispute resolution system and our courts are ready to take on several matters dealing with the same. I would like to end by once again thanking the SEAC for inviting me to this event and wish that the discussions during the conference will leave the participants enriched and equipped with the confidence that dispute resolution mechanisms in India are vibrant, efficient and consistent. Thank you and Jai Hind. That an emergency award in an arbitration seated outside India was not directly enforceable in India. However, this recommendation was not accepted and as such the phrase emergency arbitration was omitted from 2015 amendment to the Act. The recent future Amazon dispute brought forth the question on whether emergency awards are enforceable in India. The Supreme Court took a progressive step by enforcing an emergency award public order rendered by an emergency able to tribunal appointed by the Singapore International Arbitration Centre. The court held that term arbitral tribunal contained in section 17 of the Act includes an emergency arbitration within its fold. However, the Supreme Court in a subsequent order stated that emergency award can be vacated by courts. While this debate was ongoing, the future group initiated fresh litigation, even thereby proving that parties have a big role to play in the fruition of decisions relating to enforcement of emergency awards. Without the assistance of the parties and courts, decisions attempting to make India into a pro-arbitration jurisdiction will be rendered merely academic. The second aspect I am referring to is the application of group companies doctrine in India. A challenge that has perplexed jurists in India and the world is the question of whether an arbitration agreement would extend to non-signatories as well. In the case of Chloro Controls India, the Supreme Court discussed the group of companies doctrine while dealing with the case of international arbitration under part two of the Arbitration Act. It was held that non-signatory or third party could be subjected to arbitration without its prior consent in exceptional circumstances. However, in a recent decision in Cox and Kings, the Supreme Court, after undertaking a detailed review of the evolution of jurisprudential position on the group company's doctrine, opined that the same needed to be relooked. Uncertain standards of prima facie fraud, something which troubles the arbitration. 
The 2021 Amendment Act has introduced a new proviso to subsection 3 of section 36 of the Act. The proviso allows an unconditional stay on the enforcement of an Indian seated arbitration award, provided there is a prima facie finding by the court that the arbitration agreement or contract, which is the basis of an award or making of the award, was induced or affected by fraud or corruption. Courts hearing enforcement or arbitral awards are yet to determine the standards on which to take this prima facie view on the aspect of fraud and corruption on a mere reading of the documents as a detailed inquiry may be required for the purposes of such adjudication. The next aspect which I am dealing with is third party funding. Another pertinent topic in the realm of arbitration is third party funding. In essence, the concept can be as simple as third party funding in arbitration efforts of a claimant in the hope of getting a sizable return. In case of a successful claim and can also be a complex as portfolio investment, oblique a law firm portfolio financing. Without going into details of all the possible kinds of funding mechanisms and options, it will be safe to say that this area of international arbitration is still at an nascent stage.